Hey, 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 it's Rebecca, and you are listening to Resilient by Design. Okay, today's podcast is a real deep dive into that CEO mindset. What is going to take you from being a fly-by-night designer entrepreneur to being truly the savvy business person that you know you can be? My guest today is Dina Patton, and we dive into some really great conversation about this idea, like not treating your business as a hobby. Dina is the owner and founder of Dina Patton Coaching and Training. She's been an elite business and mindset coach for over 20 years. She's worked with thousands of world-changing entrepreneurs to help them build their business, their team, their revenue, their impact, and their leadership abilities. She's helped business owners elevate and transform areas such as marketing and sales, having a more greatness-focused mindset, and focusing on systems. You know I'm going to like this part of the conversation. Her passion for entrepreneurship and helping business owners comes through her great stories, her high energy. She is a number one Amazon bestselling author of The Greatness Game. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode with Dina. Listen carefully to how she describes your client. She has this interesting way of describing clients as either being a beer client, a wine client, or a champagne client. So I just want to plant that seed. I want you to start thinking, who is that client that you have right now? And she will describe them to you so you can see if really you fit into the right category. Um, And then one thing I also want you to look out for in this episode is how I share the one system that I implemented in my business that completely transformed and moved me from entrepreneur to CEO. It is the one system that freed up my time to focus on the money generating activities. And it's the one system that I hope everyone listening to is focusing on first, getting nailed nailed down. It is something that I talk about inside Power of Process. There's even a bundle about this inside my online shop for, for my students. Um, I just want you to listen out for that. All right. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. All right. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Hay, and I've built a successful interior design business by trial and error, podcasts, online courses, and so many freaking books. Over the last decade, I've grown from an insecure student to having false starts to careers, and now I'm finally in the place where I want to be. Throughout my journey, it's been pretty obvious that I'm passionate about business and helping other entrepreneurs do the same. Each week, I'll share tangible takeaways from my own experience and the experiences of other badass women to help you build your confidence and change your business. Welcome to the podcast, Dina. I'm excited to have you and I'm so excited to dive into these conversations. Um, but before I do, why don't you just take a moment and introduce yourself to our listeners today? Absolutely. I'm super happy to be here. Uh, my name is Dina Patton. I have been a business and mindset coach for 22 years of uh, business owners and leaders and uh, author of The Greatness Game. Awesome. We're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later about your book and how it's so all based on mindset. And you guys know, if you're listening, how much I love talking about mindset. And I think that's really a good place to start, Dina, because I I want us to talk about so many things. Um, So I want to be strategic about our time together. But I think everything starts with the brain. Everything starts with the mind. And what I'm seeing, and I would love to hear your take on this and sort of talk about how we can maybe reset our mindset a little bit in today's economy. Because what I'm hearing from designers is a little bit of, or a lot of fear, Mm. concern. What's going to happen? Where's the money going to come from? I'm not getting as many leads as I was before. Or I have design colleagues who've had clients bail on them entirely, postpone the project for a year cancel their renovation plans, not take the project into the implementation phase. So when you hear stories like that, it's hard not to (gasps) contract and think, oh my God, what does this mean? I need to pull back. I want to stop spending money on expenses, like panic. So can we talk about that? Because I feel like there's a lot of mindset in that 
in that fear, right? Yes, absolutely. It is, you know, when any kind of crisis happens in our life or our business, um, it's very easy for our emotions to take over. So a big part of being a leader, being a business owner is being able to discipline your emotions and discipline your mindset so they don't go into that slippery slope of what I call smallness. And um, it is uh, a very dark place. And we have always been, you know, we've all been there. And the prevention of that is really important. And that's where mastering our mindset is really a journey, you know, mastering your mindset and your thoughts and what you believe. And because that is what causes our actions and our actions then cause our results. So if your mindset is in fear or in overwhelm or panic, um, then you're going to be acting from that place, leading from that place. And you're going to get very, very different results than when you were from a a greatness state uh, standpoint. So Mm -hmm. in my book, I talk about the five uh, smallness narratives that we all get. We can, you can probably relate to one of them, but I call it P D F O D and P is for perfection. D is Mm -hmm. for distraction. F is for fear. O is for overwhelm. And then D is for doubt P D F O D. And those are the five smallness narratives that you, we can hear a lot in our, in our head. Like it gets really negative and dark sometimes. And so think about one of those that you really struggle with. Maybe it is doubt. Like you've never led your business through a crisis or through, oh my gosh, we usually have seven projects and now we have one. How do I lead me and my team um, or just myself, whatever, however big your business is out of this. It need your business needs you to be in your greatness and lead your business out of this or through this. So um so shifting your mindset um is a journey. It's not overnight. Um, but things like my book, this podcast, being in a community where people are talking about leading through it. How do we lead through it with clarity and vision? versus panic and (laughs) all of those emotions. So my question to you, I guess, to follow that is, why is it that so many of us business owners get caught up in that smallness mindset that you talk about? And how is it, if, if it, if at all different than that of a CEO, like a, like a company CEO, I feel like maybe I'm tackling two top two subjects here but like what is it that causes us to get tangled up in that mindset how can we get away from it and then how can we start thinking more like ceos and less like these little itty bitty entrepreneurs that panic every time something slows down (laughs) yes yeah well i don't think anybody teaches us in school or when we're young about emotional resiliency, around mindset, around these skill sets that are really, really necessary in entrepreneurship. And, you know, it's 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 great that we all have these gifts in our business, whether you sell a product, a service, whatever you sell, you're brilliant at that thing. But running a business takes a lot of internal and external other elements. And One of the biggest things is what we're talking about is that leadership, that mindset, that clarity, um, knowing and understanding how to use your time in the highest and best use. You know, I see a lot of struggling entrepreneurs, how they use their time is um, very, very different than how a seasoned business owner uses their time, right? You look at someone who's highly successful, whether whatever that looks like to you, they have they have a million dollar agency or they have 5 million or 50 million, whatever that is, what they have figured out is how to use their time in the highest and best use. And one of the highest and best uses that CEOs use is what I call RGAs, which is revenue generating activities, right? What what do I need to be doing and who do I need to be to be creating revenue, the next project, right? Not from panic, not from desperation, but from my creativity, from my gifts, from my greatness, from my power. 
that is a muscle that we practice. It doesn't happen overnight and someone can't just, you know, wish it upon you. Yeah, yeah. It's, oh, it's a muscle, yeah. right? And, you know, when you start to see the projects starting to slow, who are you going to be? What are you going to do to lead through that and get on the other side of that? So when you've done it two, three, four times, because I promise I've been a business owner for 27 years and it hasn't been one time. It's been more like five times where business goes way up and then comes down and way up. And we ride that roller coaster through recessions and through pandemics, et cetera. Um, so the second part of that is starting to intentionally work on those muscles of the CEO muscles. So you can be a CEO right now. You choose to be the CEO of your business. You start showing up like it. You start hiring like it. You start leading like it. You start leading. If you're a $500,000 designer, let's say, and and you want to be a $2 million uh, agency, start showing up like a $2 million CEO. I promise that it's very different than a $500,000 CEO. That yeah, I just want to really big. I just want to take a pause because I think designers hearing this are probably thinking, "Well, that sounds great, but what does that even mean to think like a CEO?" Mm-hmm. So I love, first of all, that you said the revenue generating activities. So can we maybe break it down for designers who are listening? What would those look like for you know an interior designer or interior design firm that's maybe small, maybe has one or two people working for them, or maybe doesn't have anyone? Like what I can envision is someone thinking, "Well, that's really nice. I'd love to just focus on the revenue generating activities, but what if I don't have any employees or even an assistant? Is the first step that they need to hire someone so that they can focus on those, or is it just not getting distracted by the itty bitty stuff? Like what does it right. look like on that small? Um, scale. Yeah. So, you know, if you're by yourself, that is definitely a different game. You know, you're wearing all the hats. It's very overwhelming because you're doing the billing, you're doing the marketing, you're doing the fulfillment and the design, you're reading the emails, you're managing your calendar, you're doing all of it. And so that um, entrepreneur, I would say you've got to learn the lesson of build the muscle of priority orders, right? So every single day and every, everything builds on each other. You know, you're a different business owner than you were two months ago and six months ago and a year ago, we're always learning. So giving yourself grace in the learning of being a business owner. Um, But if you are doing this by yourself, a key element is work in priority order. And so what I would say is immediately one first thing that you can do is every single day, look at the revenue generating activities uh, and do those first. And then your fulfillment of your clients, right? Absolutely are are a crucial element. Those two things are the most important things in your business is fulfilling the people who are already paying you and doing that with, with delight and great customer service and excellence and greatness. And then the other is the revenue generating activities that are generating your pipeline. So that might look like going out and networking. That might look like what is the marketing you're doing, like blogs or newsletters. It might look like social media, doing lives, doing videos. You're in a very visual industry. So use, you know, use your visuals. If you're working on a design, Maybe do a reel around that design um, or behind the scenes, you know. So all of the things that make you more visible. But I want to break that down into to a very important thing that people forget to do is understanding their target market. Who do you serve? And I have four categories: your champagne clients, your wine clients, your beer clients, and your no way clients. <laughs> And you have to know the difference. That's what I'm going to be. Right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, there's a line. There's no way. We don't do that, right? Mm. Uh, But here's the really important thing uh, around people. If you are struggling around marketing or sales, I can talk all day long around marketing and sales and ideas and sales systems and how to double and triple your income. 
But it starts with understanding who you're serving and what problems they have. You know, I've worked with a lot of designers and a lot of remodeling companies, home builders. I have three home builder, luxury home builders right now that I coach. And one of the things that literally is such a domino effect in your business is understanding your champagne client and your wine client. That is where all the time, money, and energy goes around marketing. We do not spend any time attracting beer clients. Mm -hmm. So let me just explain a beer client. A beer client is um, always shops with finances first. So they're on a very, very, very tight, tight budget. And that is their one and only discernment in, in buying, right? So who I'm going to go with whoever's cheapest, okay? So unless you make a living off of, I'm the cheapest designer in town, that's why you should hire me, which is fine. You, you, I mean, you'll make a lot of money in that. If that's a lane you want to own, then own it. Those beer clients, you can make a lot of money off of beer clients. Look at dollar stores. <laughs> you know, they're like, hey, listen, there's lots of people who just want the cheapest thing. So we're going to make a, we're making a, a company out of it and their billion dollar brand, right? And you'll hear on advertisements on your radio that says, uh, you know, they're talking about plumbing and saying, we're the most affordable plumber, have us out for an estimate, right? What they've done is they've owned that, uh, that lane of affordability. We are going to be the most affordable plumber in town. And they know that lane and they're going after that beer client. Okay. If that's you, go after it. Mm -hmm. The rest of you, I want you to think about who your champagne client is. And that client is the opposite. So their budget is not the discerning factor of how they buy. What they're looking for is excellence. Absolute right. excellence, yes. in, not only in your design, but in all the things. And that means customer service and how you do the consultation and the estimate, how you and your assistant show up. Are you on time? Like the whole experience from start to finish has to be an excellence. That is what they're looking for, your champagne client, right? And the wine client is the in-between. So they're looking for a great experience, but they are on a budget, but they're flexible. Right. So that wine client. So understanding who is that champagne client and the problems they have, what they want from me and understanding your wine clients. And then now with that clarity, now we can start making marketing decisions. You know, for me, for the most part, like I am on Facebook and I am on Instagram, but my clients are not buying 98% of my clients aren't buying off of social media. So I don't put my time and money into social media. I use social media more as fun. I, you know, I share my life and my business, but it's not part of my marketing strategy. So don't put time, money, and energy in marketing where your champagne and wine clients are not. Yeah, I, I love that advice. It's so important. It's something that I mean, I talk about that all the time inside my courses, inside my membership is like, who is your client? Because you also need to make sure that then your service offering matches what that client's even looking for. Like you might want those champagne clients, but if you are doing like hourly consulting, that may not match what the champagne client wants, right? They want someone maybe who's going to come in and swoop in and, and just do it all. And they just write a check, right? They don't want to be looking and scrutinizing invoices every two weeks, or I'm just making this up. But it's it's that idea of really understanding that client. You're right. Because otherwise, we're just throwing stuff out and just waiting to see what sticks. And it's it, it's a lot of energy. And I definitely found myself doing that a few years ago, where I was just like on all the platforms, doing all the things. Like I didn't want to do it, but I was doing like how-to DIYs and like how to design this and how high to hang your light fixture. And my clients aren't going to do that themselves. So what a waste of my time to create content to show that I'm an expert when I didn't even need that to begin with. So I, right. I think that's what I see where you're going with that revenue generating activities is understanding you need to know who your client is, is what I'm hearing so that you can understand where you need to be and where you need to spend your time to get in front of them. Absolutely. Because time yeah. is our biggest asset. 
you know, money, if you look, if you lost a hundred dollars, you can go make a hundred dollars to replace it. But if you waste five hours, that's lost. So one of the biggest distinctions between a struggling entrepreneur and a seasoned entrepreneur and a CEO is how they use their time. And they start to, you start to really understand what is the highest and best use of my time on a day to day basis. And you're going to see when you audit yourself and say, how am I good? If I looked at your schedule right now, you know, would it show me? It's just like looking at your checkbook. It's like if someone says, I'm out of money, show me your checkbook. I'll tell you where it's going, right? It's the same thing with time. You know, show me your schedule and I'll tell you why you're broke. (laughs) So it's really, really important you get that success is scheduled. All of my clients have their most important things scheduled in their time. You know, their sales time, I I make every one of my clients at least one hour a day, if not more, but it's a minimum of one hour a day in um, their sales system, their sales uh, revenue generating. That means follow-up phone calls. We all have Mm. a ton of warm leads, but did you follow up? You had a consultation and now it's been a month. Have you followed up? Right. That follow up isn't sexy and it's not a lot of fun, but it's tied to them becoming a great client of yours. We have to remember the reward of it. It's not a lot of fun this second to follow up, but the fun is closing that client and serving them and solving their problems. It's why you got into this business. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's so, so true. And I love that idea that like carve out an hour a day or whatever it might look like to make sure that you, your calendar, like this is something I've been, beca- I've become more aware of is, I mean, I always felt like I overscheduled myself, but I'm starting to pay closer attention to my Google calendar and I've color coded the activities so I can get a see at a glance, like how much time am I spent? Am I spending working on design projects? How much time am I spending on coaching, like doing the podcast and working on the online courses? How much time am I spending doing administrative work, like emails, financials, and how much time am I spending with family and personal? And I, I started to block it out because I realized like, some days I was scattering my brain too amongst all the different things, yes. which was not a use, a good use of my time. And now I'm trying to reserve Fridays for, for me, not to like go to the spa, but like maybe sometimes, but for networking, for reconnecting yes. with past clients, for yes. when someone is like, hey, let's have a call and brainstorm how we can collaborate. I'm like, hey, Friday's free. Like I have that space in my calendar to do what I see as those revenue generating activities or those CEO type of activities because CEOs always make the time for those important meetings, for those important calls like on the golf course, like, oh, the business is done on the golf course because they prioritize those activities. Yeah, they probably enjoy it, but also because they actually move the needle. Yes, and They're sitting, making, yeah, <laughs> reviewing contracts and responding to emails and cleaning out my inbox to zero might feel satisfying, but it may not move the needle. I feel like that's what you're saying. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. And if you don't have an assistant, I would say make that a goal in the next sixty days. Um, you know, a, a, a VA is three hundred to five hundred dollars a month, and you can just delegate these two things to them: your email management and your calendar management. Just have them do those two things. It's going to save you 10 to 20 hours a month that then you can reallocate. You know, when we save money, if you saved a thousand dollars on something, now that thousand dollars can be spent on something else, right? It's the same thing with time. Let's get rid of this 20 hours uh, and, and give it to a VA train her on your calendar system. I have a very, very specific calendar system. Like you said, color coded. I know what is revenue generating. I know what's admin. I know what's marketing. Um, My personal stuff, I do not like working over 35 hours. So I need to use my time very wisely. I have a lot of time in my marriage and girlfriends and my daughter. So I've got to always be in the highest and best use of my time. And so it's important to have the pockets for um, some of the admin, some of the marketing, some of the billing or finances, right? That you don't delegate to an assistant. 
your assistant, start off with them managing your calendar um, and then managing your email. And it will save you 10 to 20 hours a month. And then that 10 to 20 hours, then you're allocating to revenue generating activities, getting mm. building the relationships with your champagne and wine clients. Um, so hold on, I have to interject yeah. here. Like, what does that look like managing your email? Like, I know that there's designers listening right now who are like, um, I'm not giving anyone access to my email. Like, that sounds like a disaster. And I personally haven't done it either. I have someone who manages my calendar, who's on my team. Right. But I love this idea. Talk to me a little bit more. Let's just go on a little side uh, detour for a second yeah. here. So people understand, like, what that could look like. Yeah. Managing so- your email. Yeah, (laughs) that's a really good question. It's a good question because our emails can be really, you know, a a lot. Um, And now you can give them access to your email or you could be forwarding them specific ones. So what I mean by that is in my world, I'm always onboarding new clients. That onboard process, and I know with the designers that I work with, there's an onboarding process, right? The amount of conversations and the meetings and the design review. And I mean, there's three or four onboarding meetings, right? A VA could be managing those um, those emails out to those customers and then scheduling those, those calendar events. So it could be the onboarding process of new clients. It could be booking for um, like this podcast. And I do a lot of podcasts and speaking engagements. That's all done by via email. Right. So my assistant does does that. Um, questions like movement around clients. I know my home builders where, you know, they're working on 40 projects at once. There's a ton of customer emails that are really customer service emails. Right. So those customer service emails come into a uh, like a support email that the VA, they're not coming into the CEO. My client mm-hmm. is not managing that. Right. Um, and her assistants and her other designers, their customer service email that they give out to all their clients are coming into like a support or a help, right? And the VA is taking care of that. So there's certain, think about, think about it like this. Where are your biggest breakdowns in your business? Specifically, let's just talk about email, your biggest breakdowns in email that super overwhelm you. That is where there's no systems. And what I'm trying to do is have you pull out that one thing and delegate it. So if you're if there's a lot of breakdown or chaos around customer care, like, oh my gosh, I get 10 emails from my design clients with tons of questions, right? If that's a pain point, pull out that one. Pull out that one thing and say, I'm going to start a VA uh, just on this one system is customer care emails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, I love that. I love that. There's so many different ways to do it is what I'm hearing. Like it's not just one slice, one size fits all for managing email. And I'm realizing as I hear you talk that I already do this to an extent in the sense that any design, uh, client or vendor communication is not handled by me. It is handled by my senior designer. I am just copied. So I see those emails come in. They don't cause me stress because I'm not expected to respond. (laughs) I see them. I read them. I close them. I might file them if I'm being extra organized. Most of the time I don't. Um, So in that sense, for my design clients, that's managed. But I think for me personally, there might be an opportunity to manage some of the others, like the podcast things I just forward on to my assistant for the podcast. But I still feel like I get a lot of other emails that there could be an opportunity there Mm -hmm. for further delegation Mm -hmm. so that it's not building up Mm -hmm. and someone could maybe even I'm I am thinking I could give someone access to my email. They could just do a prioritizing system so that when I log in, I'm seeing all the starred emails, but someone else has starred them for me. I don't know. That might be a stretch. I might not be there yet, but it's yeah. such an interesting idea. Okay. I know we're getting into the weeds here, but I think it's helpful for someone who hears this and and it's like, oh, that sounds like a nice idea in theory, but you just gave us some really concrete examples. So I like that. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Well, and also just remember your own chaos, you know, take an idea that I'm saying and make it 
your own. Think about your own breakdown, your own chaos that you want to solve. Like, oh my gosh, if I had a magic wand, this is what I would solve in my email or in my calendar. That's where you want to start with assistance. And and um, always get, you know, for me, if you're going to get a VA, make sure that they're specialized in the thing that you're hiring them for. They, they Email management is their brilliant line, right? Mm. So because they're going to bring you ideas that you haven't even you just say your problems, like I want this solved right. and I want this solved and I want this solved. And they and they create those solutions. Just like how you do yeah. in, in design is you want to hear those problems and you want to solve them for your clients. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, yeah, so good. So, so let's, this is kind of a, this kind of dives into systems a little bit. And so I do want to touch on this idea because Anyone listening knows that I feel very passionately about process and I really credit establishing a repeatable process in my business with the growth that I did see. My company, you know, I grew from six to seven figures in a two year span as soon as I established these processes and started to bring people in. Like it was a game changer for me in my design business. And so that's why I feel so passionate about systems. It sounds so boring, but it really. Repeating, having repeatable systems makes frees you up to do more of what you want to do. And that is one system right there we just talked about is having bringing somebody on who can help you manage your email or your calendar. Uh, it could be someone who manages if you use a sauna or another task manager, right? I'm thinking that could be another way, like someone who's making sure, okay, you don't get too overscheduled. One thing that I see for me, and I don't know if others experience this, is we use a sauna for tasks and I get tasked all these things. But I look at my calendar and I don't have the time in the day allotted to do the tasks that are in a sauna. So I started this process of, okay, nope, I can't tackle that today. Or, okay, I need to now change my calendar to block out time to review the copy for that lead magnet, let's say, or for the website because someone needs it done this week and I need to find time to do it. So there's a little, there could be an opportunity for that. What do you see as like, the top systems, the handful of systems that a small business really needs to have to thrive? So systems is one of my three pillars that I coach in. And I love that, to hear that you're passionate about systems because it's kind of rare. Um, I I coach people in leadership. It's and not mindset. such a sexy topic, I would say. It, it's not sexy. It's not sexy. <laughs> but to me, it is because it creates a well-oiled machine that you can scale as big as you want um, or small as you want and get your brilliance out in the world, you know, which is essentially what we all want. So it's a pathway to get that. Um, But, you know, as coaching uh, business owners for 22 years, one of the biggest pain points I see in almost every single business, it doesn't matter if it's one person or a hundred people, is systems. There is a complete chaos around systems. Because what happens is when you're a one person shop, you're doing everything because it's in your head. And then you hire one person and you train them on one or two things. And then you hire another person and you train them on one or two things. And then you continue that habit, right? And then all of a sudden you look up and you're like, oh, I have 10 employees and there's no written down systems. And then past 10, now they're starting to get assistance or people in their teams and they don't have systems to train their team in. And everybody's carrying around all these systems and processes in their head. And here's the thing, that is your asset, your systems, how you do things, how you just train that that employee, that is your asset. And if they leave, they're leaving with an asset. So one of the biggest things about why I help my clients get the processes out of their head and into document them is because one, it's empowering to, and it builds confidence in the CEO and in the team, because now we know what we're doing. It's written and it's something we can follow. Two, it makes you um, consistent. So a consistent, if it's an onboarding system, We onboard our clients. I can't tell you, I am such a stickler for an onboarding system. Um, One of the, one of my uh, designers I've coached is Holly Wright Designs. And um, that's something that we worked on is her onboarding 
process so that, that every single client gets a very consistent, amazing experience coming on to her, her design, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so so that's, that's one, but it, it's not hard, but it's documenting, okay, here's the seven system, the se- seven steps of our system, who does what, because she doesn't do all, all seven steps and it's repeatable. So yeah. where you want to start in your systems is, first of all, think about anything that is repeatable. It's something that you do the same. This is how we pay our bills or this is how we get paid an invoice. This is how we onboard. This is our sales system. This is how we sell and close, right? So there's um, systems already in your business and they're in your head. And maybe you have them kind of written down, but because we're building a business and not a hobby, you have to remember that revenue generating activities are very important. So the things that bring in revenue, right? You've got to understand what are the marketing systems, steps that that work for you. There's a pattern. So if you look at your last 10 clients or 20 clients, how did they find you? Was it all referral? Was it all a networking group? Was it podcasting? Was it, you know, uh, your chamber? You know, look at the patterns that are working. And then how do you do that more often? So yeah. that's what I would think. I would say, start with the, the, the systems that are most important. You do the most, like on a daily or weekly basis. You want to systemize that first. And then you also want to focus on the revenue generating. You know, for me, the sales system, marketing system, and onboarding system are mm-hmm. three of the most important. Because if you don't yeah. have that, you're building a hobby. The onboarding, I love that that was the first thing that came to your mind because that's sort of the first thing. Maybe it's because it's the first touch point that you have with your clients, really, other than the marketing. And so I think the onboarding, I feel pretty passionate about that because it also, and I'll just add to what you were saying, is it it just makes your life easier. Like I used to have to, every time a new client inquired, I would like sit there and type from scratch a little bit about us, what our pricing was. And it would be in emails that I would send over and over. And I didn't even have it copied and pasted from somewhere. Like I wasn't even that smart. I was so scattered. I was just like, oh, I got to respond. This new person is interested. And I would just like, blah, blah, blah. And like, I think that's what I said last time. Let me see if I can find it in my sent folder from that client three weeks ago. And then they would, well, oh, they want to have a call. Oh, I guess. Yeah, sure. Let's have a call. Like it was so scattered. And as soon as I established a, a system where this happens first, then that happens, then this happens, we send them that, they have a call, we offer a consultation. It was like, like, like a weight had been lifted. Right. And I didn't have to think about it anymore. It was just, you could just do it. And then you're right. Then I could train somebody else to do it. And now I don't even touch the onboarding. I'm only showing up for the discovery call. Yes. Yes. And it's and, so freeing. And to your point, yes. it gives me time to mm-hmm. then focus on the other things, which would be ideally in a perfect world from what you're saying, those revenue generating activities. Right. Right. And so you, so it, it builds the confidence. It builds the brand. Remember McDonald's fries became McDonald's fries because they created a consistent system that now every store could do. And that was their mm-hmm. golden uh, ticket. Um, so consistency for you internally, and it it just gives you that confidence. And then it, it, as far as the brand experience, we want your clients to have an amazing brand experience that is filled with excellence and greatness and an amazing experience that you design, right? Mm -hmm. And it starts with that onboarding process. Um, so it's that brand builder. Um, And then it gives you time because what is documented is delegatable, right? So it's, we can delegate it to the other designer or the um, assistant or the customer care person. Um, But that is why systems are so important. You get it out of your head right now, put it in a Google Docs. Um, I'm a cert, I'm certified in trainual um, because I do systems so much for my clients um, Trainual is it's it's like a graduation of Google Docs is 
you're sick of Google Docs or Word, and it's just so elementary that you now have 10 employees and you actually need like a marketing manual or an employee manual or mm. whatever their role is. You need, to have, you need to have those systems and like a manual for them. So that's what Trainual is. And so it's it, it doesn't have to, you don't start there. You start in Word or Google yeah. Docs. That's where we have everything. And now things are linked in Asana, but that's how we still do it. I mean, I I think to your point, and it's interesting because I had a conversation this morning with an interior designer in my community for the podcast. And she was talking about how, like, I don't even know how I would hire someone because I feel like it's all in my head and I have to teach them and it'll just be faster to do it myself. So there's no point in even hiring. And I remember feeling that way at the beginning. And and that's where I really encourage designers to do what you're saying, which is take a pause, step back, establish a process, get some systems in place so that you can hire. And sure, you're going to have to train them, but it'll be a lot easier if you've got a little checklist of like play by play, do A to Z here, come to me if you have a question or here's how it goes, as opposed to now I need to brain dump. And my mind isn't here. I got a hundred other things going on. Like it really does help you start to, and, and scale may not be the right word. Cause I know a lot of designers in this community that aren't interested in growing this mm-hmm. multi-million dollar business. Mm-hmm. They just want to have more time back. They want to mm-hmm. feel in control. They definitely want to make more money, but they don't necessarily feel the need to hire lots of people. Mm-hmm. But I, I, but if you can have some basic systems, you can at least hire an assistant to alleviate, to give you that time back. Yes. And I, I just love that I love that you're a systems person because you just get you get it. And whether you want to whatever growth you want out of your business um, is okay. Give yourself permission. If it's a two hundred thousand dollar, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. Oh, you want to hit a half a million? No, I want to be a ten million dollar firm. That dream is yours. Give yourself permission. Whatever that number is, that's only one measure. First of all, our revenue. How many people do you want to serve a year? You know, do you want to do two homes a year? Do you want to do two remodeling uh, jobs a year? Do you want to do 20? All those measures of your own success, give yourself that grace and that permission to own them and not compare them to anybody else. They're your own game. That's a greatness game. It's like, this is the game I'm playing. This is the game I want to win. And I'm not going to apologize for it. And that's part of mindset. And I want to circle back to what you just said mm-hmm. about the woman that was like, it's all in my head and I don't want to train anybody. Um, you know, just a little hack that I've used with some of my clients. I, I have a client right now who has 27 employees and um, uh, some of them had systems, uh, probably half of them. And the other half didn't have systems, written down systems. And so I've been working with them for six months to capture all their systems. And it is a process. But here's a little hack is he had to hire two new people and neither one of those roles had systems written down. So it is it is a little tricky to hire someone and not have the systems or a manual to train them in, right? But here's what we did is we were up front in the interview and said, listen, these are the three main roles of the, 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 the reason I'm hiring you right? These are the three things or the five things. And I don't have those documented. So part of your job is going to, as I train you in this and get it out of my head and I train you, I'm going to ask you to write down this, these systems, capture them, right? As I train you in them. I and, love that, by the way. Yes. That is so, so smart. Like, don't t- put it on yourself. To have don't to put it on you. Down. Put it on them. They yeah. want the job. Let them document it and create that. I love that. Yeah. So that was a hack that like really worked. And let me tell you, when someone in the interview is like, they pull back and they're like, "Mm," that tells you a lot about that person. Don't hire them. The one that's like, oh, Mm. awesome. No problem. I love that. That's probably the person you want to hire. So it's really interesting. I love that. I love that. I mean, I'm, I realize I should have done that with someone in my organization. (laughs) It <laughs> should that be great. And can I still go to them now and say, we don't have it documented. Let's get it documented. 100%. Turn yeah. You can say to your assistant, to any of your employees and say, you know what? 
listen, I haven't been really up to date in capturing my systems and how we do things here. And one of my 23 goals, 2023 goals is documenting my business. Can I help? Can I get your partnership in that? What that means is here are the 10 systems that you manage in your role. I would love, you know, by June, give them four or five months, say by June, I would love these to be out of your head and onto this Word doc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, keep it open on your desktop. And every time you do something, you add it. Oh yeah, I do this every Monday. Or this has to happen before that. Or when I send an email, this is the copy that I always put in it or whatever it might be. Yes. Yeah. I love that advice. It's easier than you think, but I think in, you know, in our mindset is really important as we grow our business and manage our business and navigate through, you know, recessions and inflation and all of that is your greatness mindset is really important. And part of greatness is giving yourself grace to figure things out and not just get blocked and quit on yourself and say, that's Mm -hmm. too hard. I can't do that. And you know, in your design, you, you know, I'm just going to put your hourly rate. I'm going to get, you know, $500 an hour, $200 an hour, whatever you charge as a designer. I want you to get that every time you're doing admin stuff, that you could be paying someone $30 an hour, you are paying yourself $500 an hour. I know people don't think like that, but Mm. when you start to move from entrepreneur to CEO, you start to realize oh my goodness, I spent eight hours this week doing admin and calendar, customer service, all this stuff that I could be paying someone $30 an hour or even let's say really good admin, $50 an hour Mm -hmm. instead of paying myself $500. I lost, look at how much money I lost. Yeah. So that's a shift. That's a greatness shift. It's a total Uh, mindset shift. Mindset shift. Absolutely. And I mean, we don't have the time to dive into more of this, but I think a lot of that has to do with with giving up control a little bit and letting other people help you. And that's a mindset thing all in of itself, right? Is understanding that it's possible. Look around you. People are doing it. It means you can do it too. Yes. And ask your friends and ask your community saying, okay, I'm ready to hire a VA or I'm ready to hire a part-time assistant in my office or a full-time assistant, Um, whatever it is, or a junior designer, Um, you know, everybody, new level, new devil. Every time you go to a new level in your business, there's a little bit of a devil, a little bit of a challenge that's scary. And that's where you pull up your greatness mindset and you're like, I'm doing this. I know I'm going to work through being scared, but I'm going to learn and I'm going to get on the other side of this. There's enough designers, there's enough coaches, there's enough people that have gone before you that can give you advice around hiring that first or second employee because it is scary, but it's not scary enough to stop you. Yeah. And you don't have to be alone just because you work alone. Like you said that before the very beginning, I love how you mentioned community, like put yourself in community with other like-minded professionals who can you can bounce ideas off of whether it's facebook or online or it's in person networking or whatever it looks like where you're at cuz you'll start to see that you are not alone in your thoughts in your actions and how you're running your business and and you can grow faster when you learn from coaches someone like yourself or when you are engaged in an online course in a community like there's so much opportunity now oh my gosh now to connect with other professionals who can help you grow and elevate mm-hmm. okay i want to make sure we leave time for the nugget so at the end of every episode um i like to give our guests a little time to share like what would be if you had to leave with one last nugget of wisdom For our listeners today, it could be something we touched on already that you feel like you really want to emphasize, uh, or it could be something completely different, but what nugget of wisdom would you like to leave us with today? I would say um, you're always winning the game you're playing. And if you're playing smallness games, you're winning smallness games. If you're playing vague games, you're winning vague games. If you're playing greatness games, 
you're winning greatness games. So really understanding the game that you're playing in your business. And that means day to day, but also applying that to your life of what is the game you're playing in your marriage? What's the game you're playing in your health? And when you say, I don't know, you're winning the I don't know game. So that clarity, I'm, I'm very much about clarity, really asking for what you want. This is what I want out of my businesses. And this is the game I'm going to play um, without apology. So mm-hmm. love the game that you're in, own it, go and win it, um, and don't accept anything else. What you allow continues. So, um, you know, the, all those things that aren't serving your greatness and your amazing, amazing company and all the design you do, get those out of your life so that you can focus on the game that matters. I love that advice. It's like, you know, is right in alignment with what you said at the very beginning, which was that idea of prioritizing your time, right? Like prioritize what you want to be the priority. If it's your business, prioritize it and focus on the greatness game. Mm -hmm. As you, if anyone's watching this video on YouTube, you can see this awesome neon hashtag greatness game sign (laughs) behind, you know, which is so cool. Um, If you're listening, you'll have to go check it out on YouTube. Um, But I I think that that just really resonates this idea. Like so many of us dream of greatness, but we're not playing big. We're playing small. Right. Yeah. So leave, leave from that greatness mindset and um, uh, be, do have, be greatness do greatness actions, have greatness results. So um, it was great to have this conversation. I, I'm inspired by all your audience that is that are doing amazing design. I just, I love design. I love creative people. Um, we need them more in the world. And it's really easy to just get slipped back in that smallness mindset and get into fear. And I hope this you know conversation inspires you out of that and into your greatness. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Can you just let our audience know where they can follow and find you? Absolutely. So my website is Dina Patton, like General Patton, uh, dot com. And you can find my book there. You can get a consultation, hop on a call. Let's talk more, um, read about me and my journey. Um, but everything is at dinapatton.com. Super easy. Awesome. That is super easy. It's got me thinking I should consolidate all my handles because <laughs> they're not all the same. <laughs> all, yeah. All my social, I know all my, uh, all my social is different. And so, but you can find my social there, my book there, consultations there. Perfect. My brand. Yeah. Awesome. And the book, you said your book is only $10? It's $10 on Amazon, The Greatness Game. And it's going to really focus in on your greatness mindset and really help to activate that greatness leadership in you. I love it. I love it. So it sounds like a pretty affordable way to like dive into mindset. So I recommend I'm going to go check it out too. Um, Thank you so much again, Dina. Uh, It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. That's such a great conversation. I mean, I always love talking about systems and business, um, but I also especially love Dina's nugget of wisdom. You're always winning the game that you're playing. Just think about that. Like that's powerful. Essentially, I feel like it's her way of saying, stop playing small. If you're going to play small, that's who you're going to be. You're going to win at being small. If you are going to serve your beer clients, focusing on that, that's what you're going to win at. So it really got me thinking about what game am I playing? How am I showing up? What tasks am I spending my time doing? Because if I spend my time responding to emails all day, then I'm going to become a master at email responses. But is that really what I want to move the needle for me? I hope you guys enjoy this episode. And if anything, or if nothing, you took away a little bit of motivation to just dive into being and owning that role as a CEO in your business. Whether or not you want to scale your team and grow to millions of dollars, it's not so much about that. It's about freeing up your time so that you can really focus on the things that you love to do. And that's what my course Power of Process is all about. But essentially, until you can get those systems established and really free up your time to do the things you love, your business is running you and you're not running it. Or your clients are in charge and you're not. Anyhow, deep thoughts for today's episode. 
I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I'll see you soon.